Hi, going to do um, a quick revision of parallel phrasing or parallelism, which I think is probably the most powerful rhetorical device. It's uh, found in many types of text, but particularly persuasion. Now, we're going to take a look at uh, three types. There's basic parallelism, chiasmus, and antithetical parallelism. So, first of all, the really boring definition, so I hope you can get past this bit. Parallelism is recurrence in tactical similarity. Several parts of a sentence or several sentences are expressed through sim similar grammatical structures. Now that sounds really hard and it is, but when you see examples of it and what we're looking for, it makes a lot of sense and you'll be able to spot it very readily. First of all, if we take a look at these similarities, if we take a look at uh, Taylor Lautner, there is a striking resemblance to an alpaca. And what we're going to think about is, why is there that relationship between Taylor Lautner and the alpaca? Uh, for me, it's something to do with the uh, furry head, the shape of the head, the shape of the ears, and the connection between the nose and the mouth. With Brad Pitt and Robert Redford, you've got the way the smile works in terms of the formation of the uh, cheek uh, lines. You've got uh, the distance between the eyes, you've got uh, the way the eyebrows are raised, and you've also, in this instance, got uh, the way in which the hair's done. It's not that they're the same. It's just that there are similarities between them. There are parallels. Similarly, Zimmy Deschanel and uh, Katy Perry, we could look at uh, the eyes and the shape of the eyes and the colour of the eyes. We could look at um, the shape of the face again. Even with Snoop Dogg and um, this particular Dachshund, um, you've got the shape of the eyes, you've got the way in which he's done his hair so that it reflects or parallels the shape of the ears. They're not the same, even though Snoop Dogg sometimes tried to generate the similarity between himself and the Dachshund, but there are similarities in the way they're structured, and that's what we're looking for when we're looking at parallelism. The structures, the way we can spot similarities of type, grammatical or syntactic similarities, like nouns, like adjectives, etc. So if we take this particular sentence, the bored cat yawned weakly as the aggressive dog barked noisily, as soon as we read it, we can probably hear that there is some kind of balance there, which is why I started off with this rather absurd picture of um, a seesaw. There's balance in parallelism. If you don't have balance, you've just got an ordinarily constructed sentence. If we have a look at the two parts of this sentence, the board cat yawned weakly, we've got a particular pattern. We've got the definite article followed by an adjective, followed by a noun, followed by a verb, followed by an adverb. And it's exactly the same here. Definite article, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. We can spot or hear the parallel. We can spot or hear that there's a similarity between the two. Now, you can create these kind of parallels through a variety of different methods. So, for example, paralleling nouns and their modifiers, as we've just seen, if you take something like the nasty teacher with the old suit chattered on, we go, nasty teacher, old suit, adjective noun, adjective noun. Ah, there's the parallel. Similarly with verbs and adverbs. I clicked quickly and muttered endlessly. Verb, adverb, verb, adverb we can spot the parallel, we recognise there's a degree of harmony that's being created. I've always sought, but seldom obtained, an effective projector. Adverb, verb. Adverb, verb. We can hear the pattern, we can spot the balance, we sense the parallelism. And finally, although this list is far from exhaustive, using prepositional phrases to create parallelism. The teacher walks down the corridor, through the door, and into the classroom. Preposition, preposition, preposition. It doesn't have to be two, it could be three, it could be half a dozen, um, and it could be all sorts of different types. So, the key thing is that we've got to have this kind of syntactical balance. Um, going back to one of the examples used before, the teacher wrote his reports quickly, accurately, and thoroughly. We can spot the balance because of these adverbs, quickly, accurately, and thoroughly. Just a slight change makes it seem a little bit awkward. The teacher wrote his reports quickly, accurately, and in incredible detail. You lose the sense of parallelism, because we don't have the same form of adverb being used each time. The key thing is the effect. As I said, this is used enormously, so every time you spot it being used, you need to think about uh, why it's been employed by the uh, text's writer. 
First of all, it usually creates a sense of harmony and order. Because there's that balance, it seems right, it seems well structured, so it's given a sense of cohesion and balance and order and harmony. It also creates a connection between the elements that are paralleled. So you get a, you draw that connection, and that can also lead on to a particular emphasis. It can emphasise whichever elements are paralleled, paralleled. So if you have something like positive adjectives, that positivity gets reinforced each time. If we go back to that sentence again, the teacher wrote his reports quickly, accurately and thoroughly. The parallelism could promote the sense that the teacher performs their duties with diligence because the regularity of the parallel generates that sense of order, that sense of harmony. This is a teacher who's doing his job well, or her job well. This complements the series of positive adverbs that describe the manner of the report writing. So you can move from spotting parallelism to saying something effective about it. Being by the bell. And the second kind is chiasmus, or reverse parallelism. Now, this is exactly the same, except that you turn the second part of the parallelism around. So if a parallelism has an AB, AB structure, then for reverse parallelism, or chiasmus, you make it A, B, B, A. So again, using one of the examples from before, I clicked quickly and muttered endlessly would be parallelism. But if I changed the second part, just switched it around, I clicked quickly and endlessly muttered, we've got chiasmus. There are loads of examples in literature. Um, the road. You forget what you want to remember, and you remember what you want to forget. There's something about this kind of uh, structural chiasmus that makes it seem really profound, when really it's just a switch of order. But it can sometimes change the meaning. And the way the parallel functions alongside that can make it seem really interesting, really profound, create another layer of meaning because of the ambiguity. Good fiction's job was to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. We can hear the parallelism, but the meaning shifts because of the chiasmus. In the end, the true test is not the speeches a president delivers, it's whether the president delivers on the speeches. Because it's so crafted, and clearly crafted, it can suggest an intelligence in the author or the speaker as well. Just a few more. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Obviously, uh, that Shakespearean reference is uh, very famous. And it suggests a kind of inversion of the natural order, a disturbance, because we can recognise the parallel, we can recognise the ambiguity. What's fair? What's foul? Is it the weather that's foul? Is it the moral nature of the situation that's foul? There's, there's uncertainty that's created through the chiasmus. Your manuscript is both good and original, but the part that's good is not original, and the part that is original is not good. Again, these kinds of plays on words to create humour in this instance. Never let a fool kiss you, or a kiss fool you. Uh, the title of um, a text on chiasmus. And I love Mae West's quote, uh, It's not the men in my life, it's the life in my men. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. JFK loved his uh, chiasmus, as we'll see. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Two examples of chiasmus. The second one wasn't as successful. You could tell that because it didn't raise as many claps. And it's because the grammar wasn't quite as um, accurately linked to the first part of the chiasmus. Um, that awkwardness made you realise that, yeah, there was parallelism there, but um, it wasn't as perfect, as harmonious, as ordered as it could have been. The final type of parallelism is antithetical parallelism. This is exactly the same as parallelism, except it works on opposites. The best examples of this will clarify it. Um, one of the most famous is from the opening of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. 
It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. A series of opposites and based in parallelism. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Here, the, ant the antithesis is based on live and perish, you know, to live or to die. Have no step off the limb. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful for me, anyway. Probably one of the most famous speeches ever delivered. And uh, NASA must have fought long and hard, and the American government fought long and hard about what Neil Armstrong was going to say when he stepped off that, uh, that shuttle. And it's perhaps no surprise that they opted for a form of parallelism. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's antithetical parallelism, because while the first section of that sentence deals in small things, one small, just tiny, step, just one small step, for man, one man, is contrasted to uh, one giant, huge leap, huge jump, for mankind, the whole of mankind. You've got the contrast between the small movement of Neil Armstrong and the huge advance in progress for mankind, reflected in the antithetical parallelism. Okay, thanks.